interested to know more details about what we are doing for NIPE, Neuroscience Informed Psychoeducation, you can find this paper online and they can send a copy to the group of people if the people are interested to know about the details and kind of this architecture and how we designed it, the material, so you can have access to that. That's been published in Progress in Brain Research, so that's available there online. So we started to think about, okay, this is the material that we have, and uh, we put them out for people who might be able to, to use it. And we try to, at least from kind of this psychoeducation package, try not to make any copyright for that. I mean, the package is copyrighted, but we try to put that out with no charge. Just kind of seeing if people are interested to have that. And we started to receive emails from people across the world that they're interested to have the material. So in just around one year, now we have the material in 12 odd different languages. So we have them in, in Portuguese, we have them in Chinese, Korean, uh, Persian, Arabic, Hebrew, uh, Italian, I mean, there are many different versions. And they are not, I mean, being translated by translators, they are being translated by experts, addiction experts in the field, and we try to make them in a way that would kind of be in the vernacular that people are using in the recovery community. So that was really important for us to design them in a way that people can relate them to the, those materials and also think that these are our words and we can understand them. So that is what we have from, from these materials. It seems that people are interested. So we are right now thinking about, okay, how we might be able to have this material in, in Maori and other languages. So I'm hopeful that we can do that as well. So, session two. What would be the next step? If we do this for four sessions and people get interested and they feel that, okay, now I know that I can do something for my brain. What would be the next step? How can we help them to do a little bit more for their brain? Okay, so we like their brain to be activated and we like to bring those brain functions back to normal functioning. But the question is, okay, the general idea is if we do mental exercises, they're going to help. They're going to make a significant improvement. But is this the case for drug addiction or not? Or it's just too kind of simplistic to think that, okay, we can just do some mental exercises and the brain would be back. So we are going to discuss about this. And how can we design a program specific for people who are in the substance use disorder or alcohol and substance use disorder and help them to be in the process of recovery? How many of you in the class have tried to do juggling? Oh, good. Good jugglers in New Zealand. That's that's amazing. So, <laughs> Steve, how many? How many? You try. You try. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking that. Yeah. How many times you can do that, Steve? Um, well, I saw picked up. Yeah, the other, the key word there was try. I tried for years and I still can't do it. You cannot. I, don't know. I run every day. And I know I practice, <laughs> but I still can't. Yeah. I can jump. Okay, you can. How many? How many? How many balls? How, how three? How many times? Um, oh, once I'm in a rhythm, I don't know, hundred times plus. I don't know. Awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. Like riding a bike, you know. Once you're there, it, it almost seems impossible to do, but once you you've got, got it, it's. You know, it's there. It's pretty straightforward. Good. So let's think that we. I mean, we have group of people who, who cannot do that. And we start to practice on that, okay? So the question is, okay, if we start to do something like 30 minutes classes of, of juggling like this, and we do that for, for six weeks, okay? One class per week. And then we are supposed to do something like 30 minutes of practicing every day at home. If we do this for, for, for six weeks, and if we do brain imaging, doing MRI from your brain before, and doing brain imaging after of these six weeks of training, 
are we going to see change in the brain in a level that could be detected by MRI? We are talking about macro changes in your brain that MRI could see. So we are not talking about molecular changes or changes in the synaptic level. We are talking about a level of change that MRI could... I'm, I'm, I'm going to start to see what would be your level of expectation from, from the MRI. So a structural MRI. So a structural MRI could, could detect that. So doing imaging, juggling practice, and doing imaging again, and see the change. Who thinks that is going to work? OK, who thinks that who, this is not going to work? OK. So that's, that's the important question. Okay, what, what would be the level of expectation that we can have from the brain to change? That's, that's important, okay? Six weeks of kind of 30 minutes training is going to make a change or not? But I mean, it, it, it definitely changed. I mean, your brain is changing from every moment to the other moment. But having a change in a way that you can see the structural change with MRI inside the scanner. So that's, that's, that's the question. It's interesting. When I, when, when I learned to juggle, I was really sick with the flu, and I had quite a bit of time off work. So to occupy my time, I taught myself how to juggle. And it probably took me about a month before I could not stand in front of a wall. I didn't need to stand in front of a wall, and I could just go... That is interesting. Every, but I did it every day. You know. Good. And the, the question is that, I mean, your brain before and after, have you done a brain MRI? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I mean, in your life, have you, do you have any kind of brain MRI in your medical record? So you can go back and see that. Kind of, let's say he, he already has a kind of MRI before, and then we do the MRI again and see after juggling practice, do we have any, let's kind of see the MRI and see if there is any kind of change there or not. That, that's, that's the question that they have. Okay, so. A group of uh, neuroscientists in Oxford, they have done a study with that, and they published the results in Nature Neuroscience. The answer is yes. We can make significant level of change in the brain that could be detected by MRI, by structural MRI, in both gray matter and white matter. These red ones are in gray matter, and blue ones are in white matter. And they both are around an area that we call IPS, intraparietal sulcus. And why around IPS? Why IPS is involved? And here is IPS. It is in your parietal cortex, and it divides the parietal cortex to the superior part and inferior part. That is where IPS is located. Why do we have these changes around IPS? You know that the visual information from the environment would go to your cortex starting from the occipital cortex. So information would start from occipital cortex to enter to your, to your cortex. So that is the starting point. We call that visual cortex. Okay? This is the, the posterior part of your brain. So information would start from here. And then in the process of kind of understanding what is happening in the environment, in the visual kind of information, you have two main streams of information. One line of information would be divided to go to the temporal cortex. And one line would go to the parietal cortex. The temporal cortex part would be functioning to determine what are the things that are in your environment. So what are the objects that you have? What are the things that are happening outside? So we call that what pathway. This is what pathway. But this line goes up in the parietal cortex. And it's about where are these things happening? Where are those objects in the, in the outside environment? So it gets activated when you have something on the top or bottom or in the middle. So it talks about the position of different objects. This is called where, where pathway. Okay? And these changes would happen around the where pathway. Why? 
Because when you do juggling, it's about where is the ball in the environment. And this is your motor cortex. So it is between the wear pathway and your motor control areas. So it's about what we call hand-eye coordination. So talk about your eye and your, your hand. So when we have a change with the training, it's not about changing somewhere in the brain. The change would be happening first, and the change would be happening in an area that is devoted to that function. So it is not just, just a change in the brain. It, the change would be happening, and it would be happening in the area that is responsible for that specific function that you are training your brain for. Okay? The second question. If I, after a period of kind of training for, for six weeks, if I ask people to stop doing juggling practice, and after another six weeks, I go back and do scanning again. <coughs> what am I going to receive? Those changes would be gone, would be there, would be reduced. What are you expecting from those changes in your brain after stopping to do the practice for a while? I think some of it will still be there because I know that if I, I haven't juggled for a couple of years, but I know that if I picked up some balls, I could probably do it with a little bit of practice, then I'd be fine. So I think some of those changes would be permanent. What do you think? Six weeks of training, another six weeks of not doing anything. Reduced. Reduced. Stay the same. Okay. What do you see here? You see that the white matter would be a little bit reduced, but the gray matter would be even higher. So it seems that when you give yourself a little break, the change could even get consolidated there. That's the reason that when you start to learn something intensively and give, your, you give yourself a, a short break, that break could even be helpful to make those changes consolidated in the brain. So the change process would start with the training, but it would not stop when you stop training. It could go, go on and keep on the changing in the brain in a way that at the end of the day you can have more kind of significant differences in the brain in the process of recovery, in the process of kind of the training, okay? These are important messages for, for the brain recovery. You should know that brain would recover, would, would be different, would be kind of changing and it would be changing in the areas that are targeted. And the change would remain there and even get more consolidated. Why the white matter would go down? There, are, there might be different kind of potentials, but we might think that, okay, the, the white matter would bring the change to the gray matter, and then the gray matter would take the change and keep the change. So that is how, yes? Is it affected by it, it is affected by age or by disease that people are experiencing, but because I do these sort of trainings not only for people who are in the substance use disorder, I do that with normal healthy people as well. I will discuss about that a little bit later. But uh, what we know right now, when I was in the first years of medical school, I was thinking that, okay, the change would be really hard after, let's say, age of 30, 40, 50. But what we know right now in 2019, we know that people, kind of brain could be changing at the age of 60, 70, 80. So we know that brain would, but we should know that what are the things that are the best strategy to change the brain in different ages? Because there are a specific kind of functions in the brain that could be trained better in different ages. So you know that how to use this complex machine. 
And the problem with the brain is that this beautiful complex machine comes to us without any guidebook or kind of the manual. So we just receive that. We, when we buy something like a really simple kitchenware, it comes with something like this thick manual. Have you seen that? I mean, you need to, there are many things that you can do, different options, okay? But we do not receive any manual for the brain. We just receive that, it's a gift. And we just try, try an error to see, and we probably do not use many of the functions to the end. We just keep them kind of non-use. But there are definitely, I mean, the knowledge about brain is expanding. And we know much more about the brain. And we know that there, if you are in the age of, let's say, I'm, I'm 41. And I've, kind of, I, I know that there are things that I cannot do like what I was doing at the age of 25 or 21. But there are things they can do right now that I was not able to do at the age of 30 or 25. And I know that when I get to the age of, let's say, 60, 70, 80, there are things they can do at the age of 60 that they cannot do right now. So you need to know what are the functions that are not going to work. So you need to know where to start with. What would be the door that you should knock? And that's, that's an important, but the, the, the answer is there is always a door to knock, but you need to find, you need to, to know where to start with. If you are in the wrong door, you probably would not get that much, but if you know that where to start, there could be a change. Okay. Let's go back to the, what we have been discussing about drug addiction. Okay, what would be our target for recovery in drug addiction, for brain recovery? If you want to do a training, are we going, what are the things that we are going to target? For example, are we going to train people with juggling? Which we, we discussed that juggling is something that changes your brain, okay? And we, we showed that the change. Do we need that as a training for patients in addiction recovery or not? Okay, so we need to define what are the things that we are going to target. That is important because there are specific muscles that are more important for, for recovery and are more affected by drug abuse, okay? And these two things might be separate as well. So there, there are functions that are really important for recovery, not that much affected by what substance use or vice versa. So there are different combinations, okay? But what are the functions that we, we should target? What are the things that are important? If we target them, if we empower them, if we make them better, they could help people be in the recovery first, and ultimately what we like from recovery is just having people back to the community as a responsible citizen. So bring them, bring a, a responsible member of society back, functional, not just giving them something and they are good, I mean they are not kind of bothering people very much, but they are not a really productive member of the society. So that is, that is the question. What are the things that we are going to target? And we had this question kind of in different occasions, how we can design something that could target those things. So we started a, the program that we call NICO-RIDA, Neurocognitive Rehabilitation for Disease of Addiction. So we started with this program. And this program, we, we named that as Brain Gym because it's more understandable for the patient. So we started with the, kind of the term of brain gene for the patient. And as you can see, that the, it's really kind of, with lots of cartoons and so. The architecture of the brain gene program is designed to have 16 sessions. So we have 16 sessions and we, we target attention, visual spatial processing, work memory, verbal skill, and here is executive function, okay? And we provide them with different sorts of games and trainings in a graded way. So we start with level one and then level two, so it gets harder over time. Three, four, five, okay? And we have some review sessions as well. And the design is a distributed design. So graded distributed. So we train different functions each session and we try to go back to each function every few session and we try to keep a, a balanced kind of combination of different things together to get to a point that would have we will have the most efficient kind of 
way of changing the brain function. So that is how we design the package. It's called the, the architecture of the package. So we started with a, with a trial with 120 patients in opioid use disorder setting. And they have been receiving methadone. That was the, the, the setting. So they have been receiving methadone. So we divided them in two groups of 60 patients. And Tara, she was my, my PhD student at that time. Now she's a faculty member. But uh, she was the, the first kind of author in, in that, that paper. And so they had the same type of kind of background in terms of the, the cognitive rehabilitation therapy group and control group. I mean, like any other randomized clinical trials. And then we did the intervention for four weeks, so two sessions per week. And they have been in a residential set, compulsory residential setting for eight weeks. That was their range. I mean, that was the, the program that we have been doing this in, the, in that program. And so it's 16 sessions, eight weeks, two sessions per week, four for eight weeks. And they have been receiving methadone as well. And then we tested their cognitive functions over time. And we followed them afterwards for six months. So T0, T1 would be first month, that would be the second month, and then three months after that, and then six months after that. As you can see, in the control group, some of the functions would just get worse over time without active intervention. And that is the case for recovery. You should know that some of the patients would, would kind of have reduction in their cognitive function in the process of recovery. So they feel that when I was using drug, my brain was functioning better than while I'm, I'm in recovery. So that's, that is what people kind of complain about. And even in, in the kind of people who are in the treatment, you can see that there are some of the patients that some of their functions would just go down over time. And those who have been receiving the, the rehabilitation, so you can see that they are getting, in at least in some of the cognitive functions, better than the other group. In terms of the follow-up of these patients, so as you can see that they have been in the residential setting for, for eight weeks, and then we followed them for three months after. Up to three months, it was reasonable. So we had them something like 60% still in the kind of outpatient, because after the residential, they have, have been in the kind of the, the outpatient program. So they had to come to the center once per week. That was the, the program. But after three months, the dropout was huge. And we ended up in kind of after six months follow up, some like twenty percent retention at the end of the day. And this is the uh, rehabilitation group. This one is the kind of the control group. You can see the rehabilitation group had a better retention, but at the end of the day, it was not significant. So we didn't have any significant difference in terms of retention between those groups. And it was, to be honest, frustrating for some extent because. The problem is that we had 80% just drop out. That is the, I mean, that's the, the reality of addiction treatment. So you know that there is no panacea for that. It's, it's just really, really complex. But we realized, we, we tested their, their urine drug test in their follow-up. And we saw that those who received the, the, the real treatment, they had significantly lower both morphine, I mean the, the, the opiates, and meth drug use in their, their urine drug test. So they had significant better kind of, those who were in the treatment, they were kind of, kind of significantly better in terms of the, these functions. <coughs> okay. So if we publish the trial, this has been published, well, this is one of the first trials with opioid use disorder for brain rehabilitation. This is the, the, one of the first ones. And yeah, it has been kind of cited. It's, it is possible, I think, eight or nine trials in, in the field that people have done so far. I mean, across all the different kind of substances. OK, after running the trial, we started to think about, OK, how can we improve the, the package? How can we go for something like Brain Gym 2.0? And what would be the shape of the brain gene 2.0? We already have brain gene 
the original BNG, and we use that. That's a really good good package. But we have uh, sort of okay. We want to start another one. What will be the next step? Okay, so let's think that I'm going to provide you with a, a nice, warm, fresh brownie right now. Okay, I'm going to ask you to rate your interest to this brownie from zero to 100. 100. 100. 100. Probably 50. 50. 110. 10. <laughs> zero. Okay, we have zero. Okay. We've just eaten. So yeah. zero. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So we have. A, the, okay. I'll take all these and make it 150. Okay. Good. Awesome. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. At the end of the class. 100. From 100. Zero to 100. Five. One. So you can see that people are different. Even inside the class, people are, are we have zero, we have 150. So, okay. What about this one? The quality is better here, but the, 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 the light is, is on. So, but yeah, it's good. So it's really, it has also a, no. Is it still browning? It's, it's brownie, the best type of brownie that you ever had. Okay. What about this chocolate cake? Oh, that's poison beer. Those poison beers. Yeah. Oh, 200. We need a different reward money. Okay. I chopped it in a slab. What is the base pastry in Auckland? Base pastry, yeah. Um, Custard Square. Oh. Custard Square, okay. What else? <laughs> okay, what, what are the other really good pastries in the town? The French croissant. French croissant, okay. What else? There's some good pie shops that, you know, that make uh, like steak, mushroom, and bacon. Oh, they are really good. Okay. <laughs> and also chocolate cakes. Let's think about the kind of the best chocolate cake you have ever had. What would be the rating for that? Zero to one hundred. <coughs> Nothing. A slab of Whitakers, though. Okay. So that is what we call. Craving, okay? So we are talking about craving, food craving. There are people in the class that they experience food craving right now. And there are people who say that, okay, I just had something and I'm good. I do, I, I'm not hungry. Maybe if I show this picture at 1 p.m., they'd be more efficient, okay? So that is how we manage that. But this is, I mean, those who are working the field of drug addiction, that, that we know the craving very much. That's a kind of a, a core in, in addiction recovery. So that is that's craving. And what we call here is called cue-induced craving. We have some cues, and those cues would induce craving. And it is the same for, for, for those who are using drugs. When we show them a picture related to drug, that makes them crave. And you know that the drug craving that patients in the recovery experiencing is much more powerful than food craving. Something like up to 100,000 more powerful. And there are stories about that. There are something like 10 to 100 times stronger than even kind of sexual craving. So it's really powerful kind of urge that people would experience with these pictures. So we start to think about, okay, how can we bring drug craving as a core to Brain Gym 2.0? How can we add that? How can we target that? How can we train the brain in a way, in a way to be able to deal with craving in a more efficient way? So how can we make people able to regulate their craving? And if they can regulate their craving, they re can regulate other impulses. They can also regulate their emotions. So the, when did you target that hot cognitive functions, they are, we call it domain general. So when you are able to regulate 
your impulses, you can regulate others. I mean, you can regulate emotions. You can, that's, that's what we try to add in Brain Gym 2.0. How can we do that? But to be able to do that, we, we needed to have a measure of craving. And what we do in our center, my center is focused to use brain imaging. And I mean, that's, that's my kind of speciality in terms of doing brain imaging for psychiatric disorder, okay? So we needed to have to be able to see inside the brain before the treatment and then do the, the rehabilitation and see inside the brain again to see what is happening. So we needed a large database of pictures because we needed to cover the patients with different types of drug use. So we started to develop a large database of 360 images. As you can see, that the top one are, are neutral images. The middle are mainly opioids. And the down are, what are these things? Please. Meth, right? Mm -hmm. They are meth. And we asked our patients to rate these pictures. This is one sample patient. From picture one to picture 360, these are control, meth, and opiate. And for craving, between zero to, exactly like what, what I did with you with the brownie, okay? And they, as you can see, this is the rating for control pictures, rating for meth and, and opioid pictures. Okay. So, yeah, some of the controls are, for, at least for this, this sample patient, some of them were close to some, probably. And as they are seeing pictures one by one, and sometimes they have lots of, kind of drug and then one neutral, so they still have the craving and they just, even they can see some neutral pictures as sort of related to drug, okay? So, we, and you also asked them to rate them in terms of balance and arousal and typicality and related. So it was a kind of a, a comprehensive assessment. And this is a, the distribution of, for example, the control pictures are more towards the zero, and then opioid and med pictures are around the 100 in terms of the, the craving that they can make, okay? So we start to have this. And then we developed a paradigm, a, a tool, that we have been showing drug-related pictures and neutral pictures to them while they have been inside the MRI scanner. And we have been exploring what is happening inside their brain, okay? While they are seeing neutral pictures, while they are seeing the, the and we designed the cues in a way that as you can see, in both pictures you have two hands with the same kind of light. I mean, everything is similar. The only thing that is different is it's about, it's not about drug, this is about drug, okay? And we kind of added several kind of non-drug related, drug related, and okay. It has many details in terms of how we design these things in a way that kind of induce the most efficient way of inducing craving. Okay, and we have been kind of showing these pictures for something like six pictures, six pictures for neutral and drug, and we have been testing that. So just, just showing you a, a sample activation, okay? So when did they see drug-related pictures compared to neutral? These are the activations inside their brain. So there are many parts of the brain that would get activated while they are seeing drug, but not neutral. Areas related to their attention, these are the limbic areas inside their brain, some areas related to control of that. So there are, so we can measure what is happening inside the brain in terms of craving. So and we use these platforms before and after the brain training. So that is how we kind of design a trial and the, that is, I mean, that is how the future of psychiatry is moving forward. So we are bringing neuroimaging as something like EKG. How people in the cardiology using EKG. They take your EKG, based on your EKG, they decide what to do for you and then afterwards they do EKG again. Neuroimaging is going to act as something like EKG for psychiatrists. Hopefully, I mean, we are, I mean, there are many things to be done, but that is how we kind of, that is how our institute is designed to kind of 
invest on science of kind of psychiatry. What are they going to do about the medication side? We can do, I mean, that's another side that we do. We, we, we test different medications with the same things. Okay, if we do, let's say, if we give people methadone compared to keeping them abstinent, what would be the pattern of brain activation? I have a specific study published recently that showing that those who are receiving methadone, they do not experience some subjective feelings of craving. But then you, they see these drug-less pictures, there are still specific activations in parts of their brain that is not conscious. But they are related to some of the kind of learned motor habits. And, and it, it can be happening that they, they see that they do not have the craving, but it seems that their leg is just moving towards using that. So they, have the, they still have those habitual motor behaviors to go and take drugs, but they might not have, because those who are in the kind of well-controlled methadone programs, they, they, they do not have that level of craving for, for opiates. But I mean, the, so we use these methods not only for, I mean, things that I've been discussing, but also how, how these things are going to be helpful for testing medications and other things as well. So that is, that is how they are designed. But, they're really cutting edge science. So these are, I mean, there are just few centers across the world that they are able to do kind of these, these imaging. But we designed the Brain Gym 2.0 for this. I'm not going to discuss about the brain changes and specific activities, so that's not my target. I'm just going to introduce you Brain Gym 2. But just to give you an idea how we just test these changes inside the brain and how we follow these changes. Okay, so we start to design Brain Gym 2.0 for being focused to craving versus neutral. And we needed a, a model. What are the cognitive functions involved when you have drug craving? When you see that brownie, and you really like to, to eat that brownie, what are the functions that are involved? Okay, I'm not going to discuss about the details about that. I'm just going to give you a heads up. I'm, I will give you more details about that. But there are specific functions involved, okay? And there are different brain areas involved, okay? We know that is, it seems complex, at least in the first, first, first look. But to make that easier for people to understand, we have started from using cartoons again to make that simpler for people and make some examples about eating. So we have food-related cues in the environment, okay? The first function that would be involved is attention. So we know that those environmental cues would grab your attention. That is the first step. Then memory would get involved. You have lots of memories with those brownies, right? Good memories, good experiences with those, with those brownies, okay? That is the, the second function. So if you want to target that, we need to think about attention, we need to think about how to change those memories. So that is another target. Then there's a function that we call saliency, or how do we evaluate things? Okay, if I do this, what is going to happen? If I stop doing this, what is going to happen? So you start to think about, okay, if I take this brownie, what is going to happen? How much gain I'm going to take? So you start to, and there are people who see brownie, they really, they have good memories with brownie, but they would, when did they start to think about, okay, what would be the effect of eating the brownie? It just get, make me fat, and they would just stop here. But if you have good memories, and you start to say, okay, if I take this brownie, that would taste wonderful. Then you would start to see the changes inside your body. So you will start to feel that in your body, that we call introception. So you start to feel that, okay, it seems that I really like it. That is the, the feeling that you start to, to, to have in your body. And those feelings would be happening with changes in your body. And sometimes you might even having your heart racing, that would be the extreme case. That when you see a brownie, you just have your, your, your heart racing for brownie. 
or some other changes in your body, you just feel that your hands are cool or something, like that. that will be an extreme response to that. But that is another level. And then you might feel that, like, okay, should I do that or not? Okay? And then there will be a response. Okay? So, because this model, easy core model, or be named as easy core, describing the functions that we need to target. Okay? We need to improve attention. We need to change memory processing. We need to change saliency processing. We need to change interoception. We need to change control to be able to change this response. Okay? And it is the case for drug use as well. So we have started to develop the easy core model for substance use. And we have started to think about how we can train specifically these functions to help people to be in control. That is our target. Okay, so how we started to target these functions, okay? We, we developed a program that we called Neurocognitive Empowerment for Addiction Treatment. NEAT. It's, yeah, that is the name. And it has 16 sessions. Okay, now it's getting more intensive. So we are doing an intensive program. As you can see, so we start from overview, attention, and then negative valence, attentional bias, positive valence, interoception, a review, and then session 9, 10. That is, that is the design, okay? The architecture, we start from an introduction. Then we have sustained attention and working memory. And then we add flexible attention to this. This is called an hierarchical architecture. So the architecture here is different with the architecture of Nicorida, the, the first one that we developed, the brain gym one. So we add interoception to this. And then we add, so we have games for Sustained attention and negative attention here. So we add things up step by step. And then we have positive attention. That's exactly what you have mentioned, that people should have attention to the positive aspects of their life. We train people for that specific part. And then we have inhibitory control. Then we have a review. Review is going to be really important to just catch up with everything. And then declarative memory. Uh, Emotional memory, prospective memory, executive control, episodic future thinking, monitoring. So we add functions one by one to target these kind of these functions. And then review. That is the design of the 16 sessions. Okay. But I'm going to give you a, a one session copy sample. There are, I mean, the 16 sessions are available. So we, I had a copy with myself. I just forgot it to bring. The, the, the package will show you how, how the package is designed. So you can see that we have for each session, we have 16 pages of games and trainings. Okay? These are four sample pages. And this is the architecture. So we have one scenario, as I told you before, about that specific function we are going to target. And then some basic concepts, brain tips, brain games. This is how it is being designed. OK, we are distributing sample sessions. For those people that haven't helped themselves already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me? Can we have a look at the other ones somewhere online? Uh, I, can, I can give you copies. Yeah. yeah. OK, so let's, let's go to, I'm going to do one of those exercises with you. So let's go to the second page and start to do this exercise here. You are supposed to write down the 
without taking a look inside your phone. Do not use your phone. <laughs> write, the, write it down. You know that there is A, B, C, D, something like that on the, on the numbers. Yeah. There are. OK, write them down, whatever you think of in your memory. There should be A to Z somewhere on the, under the numbers, yes? Yes. But yeah, whatever you can imagine, you just try to, to use your best memory. It's not going to work for too many more generations, is it? Yeah. But even the, the, the cell phone, the, the new cell phones, they, have, they still have those numbers. No, do not, do not use that. Oh, do not cheat. Do not cheat, yeah. So you don't know whether they have or not. You will, you will check that again. OK. You, 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 have you seen that before? There are the ABC. I, uh, I have. Yeah. I know there's a few lot together. There's ABC, D, and then there might be. Yeah. So if you different typewriters, you don't know the rules. OK. It's not a question. Anybody who has no, do not use your phone. Oh, it says check your mobile phone. After, after. Oh, after. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember? Anybody who has finished that? Yeah. Okay. Anybody who likes to show the response? Have you done that? I think I've got up to R, but the one's got four letters on there. One would be, what are the, the... Oh, sorry, so two, it starts at two, A, B, C. Two, A, B, C. D, E, F, H, I know six is M, N, O. Yeah. Oh, yeah, six is M, N, O. Now you can go back and see your phones. <coughs> Bring up the screen. Oh, this is human oh, Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Nine has got nine and seven. How many times have you seen that before? Oh, how many times do I take How many times? This screen is, is being used all the time. For you. Yes. Are you using that? Or, so you are seeing that every day, but you didn't have any. Why? Because you, you didn't pay attention to it. Okay. So we start from this point discussing about attention. We discuss that, okay, if we pay, do not pay attention to something, the information about that thing would not enter to the brain. Okay. And we discuss how paying attention is going to be important and how sometimes not paying attention is going to be important. <laughs> Okay? So we start to discuss about that and how attention is going to help you for recovery. How you can use your attention to help you in the process of recovery. And then we bring some other games. And so this session is about introducing attention and how attention is going to be important for your memory and your, your function, or your daily function. Okay? So as you can see, let's start to kind of review the session. Can I have a one copy? Mm, okay. To have a, no, no, just a, 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 one extra. There's an extra copy. One extra copy? No? It disappeared. Disappeared, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just be happy. Okay. So the first one would be the scenario. As you can see, that this package is the feminine package. We have a male package as well. So those who like to have. So because we think that that would be important to have. We can have, I mean, one gender package, but I mean, we try to. Consider that as well, as well. So there is a scenario, as you can see. Then we start to do some basic education regarding the attention. And then we do this game that we just kind of did together. And we start with, with another game. So we, we run these in the, the group session. And it's fun. It's totally fun. So people, there are many sessions, the, the, the trophies that the people like to just not attend. But this one is not something that people like to 
to be absent. So, and the say, other material, other education and trainings. And the other good thing about this package is we have developed a, kind of a tropy manual for that discussing about details, timing, how tropics should be able to run different kind of parts of So that's, that's how, how we designed this. And then you have a homework part. So there are eight pages for the class and eight pages for homework. So it's not just about the class. So they have other kind of exercises that they are supposed to do as a homework. So we, kind of, we print them in something like a binder, and each session has one booklet. Each one is printed as an independent booklet. And we give them the a, a large bind, kind of binder, and each session we give them a new booklet that they add to that binder. So that is how it is designed. Okay? So, and th there is a, something like an answer sheet for that. We do not give them, we give the answer sheet session by session. When they do the session, we give them the answer sheet of that session. Okay, that is the, and it would be ending up with something like a, this thick kind of binder. And that is what we provide them. And we have another booklet that we call Brain Planner that gives people space. It's something like um, planners to write down what they are doing and there are specific things because it's not about doing some games in the class. They are supposed to do these activities and a strategy in their real life. Because if we just train them for some games in the class and they are not going to change anything in their real life, that's not going to work. We are going to transfer those kind of trainings and games and knowledge to the their daily life. And that is how this, this package is going to work. That is how we, we designed this. Uh, and yeah, that would be interesting. I have published a, a, a version of the brain planner for normal people. I mean, that's, that's one of the developments that they have. And I use that for myself as well. I just kind of, I write my things as well. So I, when I do something for patients, I usually do that for myself, just seeing that if it's going to work or, or not. Why is it mm. Because this version is in Persian. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a Persian version. I have a kind of English version, but this was, yeah, I use the Persian version. That, the Persian version is on the other, so they start from, from this side, so that's. Can I ask, is there any difference if you did this in a paper version, or if you did it as an electronic thing? Because I prefer paper things, but a lot of the youth have only ever done electronic, you know, right from school now. That's true. That's true. Uh, I realize that even for, for youth, we, we like the paper one more because there is a better connection and you have a more control what is happening in the class. What we are doing right now, we are kind of running the, the material here in online classes. So we use GoToMeeting platform because we have patients that it's really hard for them to attend in the class. So what we do, we give them a kind of a meeting link every week, and they just click on the link and they attend to the class, like a Zoom meeting that we already have here. And we do the, the exercise together in a kind of group, online group therapy session, and it works perfectly well. And they have to, they, they compete to each other, they should, and they all kind of turn on their cameras, and we see each other, we discuss about different things, and they just can get connected from their home, something like 5 to 7 p.m. that they are out of their work, so they have time, and they already have their coffee beside, so they, it's really convenient for us. And even kind of right now, I'm running that in a few other countries as well, that makes it easy for us to help them from US. So if I can arrange the time, we can just kind of help people who are, kind of, for the first sessions, we sometimes we just run the sessions from US in another part of the world from just uh, online platform. So we have the tropics. I have my tropics in US running the class in other countries. So that is how, how we kind of manage that. So, so do you believe there's something more useful doing it as a group as opposed to doing it as individuals? The good thing about the, the package is it brings a sort of interaction inside the group and they compete each other and makes a really interesting dynamism inside. And I like that. And I, like, I think that it get, makes it more engaging. And they just see each other 
and there are people who are better, there are people who are, and I like the kind of, the, the, I've never done that in, in a kind of individual, it's, it's do, definitely doable, and I had patients that, uh, because of, kind of they have been allocated to the, to the sham group compared to the active group, and at the end, they ask us to receive the package because they really love to kind of have, so they have done that themselves, even something like a self-help package, and they liked it, and they, they really liked that as a self-help package, but, I mean, running that in a group setting is something else. So just you see that how time flies in the session. Something like 90 session would be something like this. So we start and we realize, oh, that's that's it. We we, we have done the, the the entire 90 minutes. So what are the golden steps? What are the things that you need to know about when you run these sessions? First of all, you need to get sure that people, your patient know about what is going to happen and be interested about that, okay? So that is one thing that is going to be important. Especially when we run the deny the package first, the, the, kind of the psychoeducation package, they have, they have a, a good understanding of what's going to happen to the next step. So they really like to attend the brain gym. So that is the good thing about running the simple one first and then from the simple one going to the more complex one. Or we run a specific kind of discussion setting that discuss about what we are going to do and those who are interested, we, we bring them to the, to the treatment. We do a cognitive assessment before starting the, the session and patients know that when they do the cognitive assessment, and they receive a, something like a simple profile of their cognitive function, and they know that we are going to test these functions again in, after the session. So they are motivated because they know that we are going to test these things again. So they really like to, something like a kind of pre-post exam, so they really like to get better, and they really like to kind of have a better functioning. We need to make things simple for the trainer, because <coughs> We realize that we can train people, I mean trainers, if they do the entire package once with our therapists or attend one of the classes for the full kind of 16 sessions, they can run it themselves. So it is not that much complex to learn. So it's pretty much simple and straightforward. But they need to have a, some basic understanding about cognitive functions. And we provide them with some kind of basic education regarding how different cognitive functions work. Like what we did, we, we did today, starting from what are the deficits that people have. So we, we realize that we need to provide specific trainings for, for therapists to have a, a, a model about, or a series of models about how cognitive functions are being processed in the brain. And we also need to give trainees metacognitive awareness. So I think you realize during the last couple of, kind of hours, during that two, three hours, you have an idea that how we give people a metacognitive awareness about what is happening inside their brain. That is how we, we kind of give people an understanding about their brain. And then the exercises are going to be graded. I mean, graded in, in terms of kind of from simpler one to the more complex, and they are supposed to do homework, and they are supposed to bring the homeworks, and we give them feedback based on the homework. And I have, I do not have, a, I probably need to take some pictures from that. I have boxes of colorful pens in different colors, and when they bring their homeworks, when they have, uh, we kind of we judge the homework together, and we give the five best homework a, a new kind of color pen. And it's really fun, so we just have, and they, they can take what, whatever color that they like. So that is one of the things that we kind of do in this session. And they do, have to, they do the homeworks with the, those color pens. So it's just another kind of fun activity that we do. So we have some additional materials. I told you, we have planner, we have some flashcards. We give them these things, something like kind of with, with magnet, that they can do that on the uh, refrigerator. So put those uh, simple models to the to the refrigerator and some other parts of their home. Uh, we really like these things to be happening in their daily life as well. So all the exercises that you have, and you can see some of these exercises here, that there is a box at the end of the exercise. So for example, when we, 
if you go to page 27, the third page, when we do the exercise, and we discuss about, okay, this is focused attention and why focused attention is important and all other things. We also have a specific box at the end discussing that, okay, what would be the same scenario in your real life? Okay? Because we need to bring this metacognitive awareness to their real life. It's not just about this game. It's about what does it mean to my real life? And that is how we Exactly. We have some review sessions that are really important to just consolidate what they have learned. We do reassessments and we think that kind of encourage them to change their lifestyle as well. There are specific lifestyle changes as a part of the, the brain rehabilitation. We think that they are, these parts are important. And I told you, they are going to be engaging and, and relatable. So we recently received a, a large fund from Oklahoma Center for Advancement of Science and Technology, and we are running a, a new trial with, with that in, in different settings. OK, so I received a question from, from you guys in terms of, OK, when do we run these sort of kind of trainings for, for patients? What would be the best time of starting these things? Should we start from the second week, third week, the first day? How, how do we kind of use this material? So what, I'm, what I was providing you, we have, so we have posters, we have NIPE, and we have NEAT. So these are the three packages that we have, okay? The brain healing would be four to five sessions. NEAT would be 12 to 16 sessions. And why they are different? Because the good thing is we have developed everything from scratch. All the cartoons that you see, all the games, everything is developed from scratch in-house. So we have sort of kind of full flexibility to change. So right now we tr run a trial with brain gym with 14 sessions, because we are running that in the, in the treatment setting that they needed that in 14 session. There are occasions that we, right now we are developing a new version in eight sessions, because we have been doing that in the set, setting that they had their patient for just four weeks. So we had to compress that in. So it's, it's modular in a way that we can just bring some module out, add some module in, so they're just flexible based on the needs of the so that, that makes things easier. So we think that the posters could be even helpful before recovery. So we mount them in places that potentially receive any sort of, or even general clinics. And we add below some kind of directions for those who are interested to receive treatment for addiction. So we provide, we provide them with these three posters, and we say that, okay, addiction is kind of affecting your brain. There are hopes that you kind of, your brain could get better if you have the same experiences. Just call us and come to see what we can provide you. So we use the poster as something like an engaging material for make those who are non-treatment seekers treatment seekers. Because there are many patients that they feel that there is no hope. There is no way that it can get better. Okay. Or sometimes they do not have the awareness that I mean, addiction is affecting their life. But when they, they see these pictures, and sometimes they, they, even they come to me and tell me that, okay, this is, for example, this one in their sleep. I've had many patients that they were t telling me, this, was, this is exactly the feeling that they have when they want to go to sleep. So they just point to some specific cartoon saying that I saw this poster out and I was going to tell you that is exactly the thing. What can I do for this? What can I do for this? What can I do? So they just see themselves in these cartoons and tell you that this is exactly the problem I have. How can I do for this? How could I can I do for this? So that is the how. And the cartoons will provide them with hope and kind of understanding and how they can do something for their brain. So I think that kind of the, the posters could be used even before starting the recovery. So hopefully making a motivation for those who are interested to come to treatment. 
And then we do the brain healing, usually in the very early recovery, probably from the first week. Whenever they get just a stable in a way that you can do something for them. And then we do the brain gym in kind of a little bit later when you do the, the first step. And in, in US, we have three major types of settings. One is residential settings. We usually do the kind of brain healing in the detox. And detox in US, is most of the time, is four weeks. I heard that here, most of the programs are not, I mean, even shorter. But US, in US residential settings, you, kind of the detox is something like four weeks. Uh, and we complain because it's just four or eight weeks is, is almost nothing. We are right now working for six months residential programs. And I, I work with like another center that, I mean, help, helping them to develop a program for, right now we are working on three months residential. That's, it's something like treating cancer in just two weeks. <laughs> it's crazy, right? I mean, you just, when you feel it, okay, you bring a cancer patient and just, okay, you have just one week, two weeks, three weeks of just career, that's not going to happen. It's just a chronic condition. It happened over the time and just, I don't know. But yeah, that is the problem in, in, in some places. So, and then when they leave the residential center, they go to the transitional living or so, sober living places. We call, there are different programs like Oxford Houses, and we work with them to bring people for, for brain gym. We realize that people who are in this stage, they are hard to attend to the kind of physical session. So we try right now doing the, the online, online settings. And they can attend in online settings with just from their cell phones. So it's, makes things really simple. And we also provide for some of patients something like a tablet that they can just, something like $100 tablets, really simple tablets, but they can get connected with those tablet tablets. And they receive something like a book, the, the, the workbook. So they have a workbook and a tablet and two sessions or one session per week. They just attend online group session. And it works really well. For hospitalized setting, we, we realize that it's doable to do that in a hospitalized setting in a kind of more, let's say, crash course of doing that in four, four, four sessions, or in intensive outpatient. Or even we, we try that in an office based setting, for example, in the buprenorphine or suboxone clinics, and we do induction and then stabilization. Probably mainly in the stabilization phase, we can do that. And then after doing that, we realized that most of our patients would come back and say, okay, I've done the 16 session of brain gym. What can I do next? So that is the, the feedback that we receive a lot. And we loved it. So we started to develop material for those who want to continue doing these things with something like extended brain gym. And we think that this is something that should be happening. We need to provide enough material for something like one year, if they are interested to continue doing this. And then we refer them to some other resources outside. There are books that are for public, I mean, general population, but people in the recovery could use as well. So it, it, if it is going to be effective, it's going to be long there. No treatment in drug addiction is going to be effective without being long term. And probably the only types of treatment that we already have that they are efficient across the world are things like NAAA, and they are lifetime. Or things like methadone maintenance programs, that they are long term. So it, if it, I mean, it's really hard to have a short term program that is going to be effective. So we need to think about, but we need to start from simple steps. Sometimes just mounting posters in a clinic is an important, significant step. And then think about, okay, how can I run a four session kind of start? And then think about the, the extensions. Those who are interested to have kind of more details about the cognitive rehabilitation package that we have, there is a, a book chapter and I would be happy to share that with others to just if they want to read about the details. And over the time, I received, I received many feedbacks from patients that we have that, can I have a copy for my girl? Mm -hmm. Can I have a copy for my, my daughter? I wish I had this education when I was 16 years old. 
I wish I knew more about my brain when I was 18 years old. And we realize that we can modify many of these kind of educations for adolescents, for youth. Discussing about self-control and emotional regulation and how it's happening inside the brain and how attention is important, why memory, and talking about brain for kids as a tool for resilience. So now this is the next step that we are working on that. We are working to develop this. That's the kind of, I'm writing a, a book chapter about this idea right now. I'm going to kind of revise the, the chapter in my flight back to US. This is a really kind of active, ongoing task that I'm doing right now. Kind of doing that and, and revising the, the, and I hope that in two, three months we will have the entire package for, for youth population. <coughs> and I, I, I can see great potentials for that as well. And even we have started to develop cartoons, specific cartoons, <coughs> to communicate with kids about drugs <coughs> through the lens of neuroscience. Over the time, I realized that probably one of the best ways for drug addiction prevention is talking about brain. Because when we start to realize about such an important gift that we have, and how drugs could, could make a change, as a neuroscientist, I'm a really kind of explorative and curious and adventure-seeking person, but I I would not put my brain in risk for any, any experience because I know that it is probably the most valuable thing that I have in my life. So I'm not going to experience cannabis. If it's going to change my brain for, let's say, 1.0001%. Because it's, it's such an important thing that I have and I really don't like it to be different. I just, I, I really like it to keep it functioning as it is, okay? So talking about how drug and how <coughs> dependency could happen. So it is not just about using one drug for one time. We know that then you use it one time, it would not be just one time. It would be the second and the third and then... Sometimes patients think that, okay, kind of use people that think that, okay, I know that if I use this drug, it would kill something like 100 neurons, okay? But they already have 100 billion. Okay, 100 isn't that much. But use that, and that will be that will kill 100 neurons. That will be fine. So that is that is how people, that is done. But that is not the reality. The reality is that if you use it one, there will be a second time and third time and 100 and. So we usually kind of tell them, okay, something like this, kind of, something like this. You like to experience it, but the problem is when you go to this, you cannot stop. You could just go to the end. That is, your brain would get... And how we... That's another kind of totally different story, but we try to use neuroscience to communicate with, with adolescents about, about drug. And it really is a really interesting way to do that. There are specific resources on, on publishing a new uh, special issue in, in Frontiers about brain and cognition for prevention and recovery. Uh, that is another <coughs> thing that I'm doing. Uh, I have a book chapter in, there is a textbook, an international textbook on uh, brain rehabilitation. It's called Neuropsychological Rehabilitation. And I have a book chapter on that kind of textbook about rehabilitation, brain rehabilitation for psychiatric disorders. And it's not just, just about drug addiction. I mean, in all the psychiatric disorders, we, we can do brain rehabilitation. And uh, as you can see, that Substance use in one of the, the targets, but kind of psychotic disorders, affective disorders, and there are different targets. Uh, we can target cognitive processing through the behaviors, and then in the first brain gene one, we have been targeting mainly memory, learning, attention, executive function, but we really realize we need to add other dimensions. That is the brain gene 2.0. But the brain gene one is still working really well, so we, I really like that one as well. So, but I mean, there are different targets. Okay, take home messages and then I will have time. We can discuss about some of the other details. Before going to take home messages, what are the questions that you have? Let's 
see if you have any questions, anything that you'd like to know. Okay. So the way that you approach this, it doesn't matter what substance you're using, so it works equally well for alcohol as opposed to, say, cannabis mm -hmm. as opposed to amphetamines, opiates, there's no difference. We try to cover kind of shared codes for different substances. We know that there are specific cognitive deficits for different drugs <coughs> as well. So we know that those who are using cannabis, they have more problems with attention and memory. Mm -hmm. yes. Or those who are using alcohol, memory is a uh, more important issue. So there are minor differences between different drugs. Or those who are, for example, using meth, they have more problems with their kind of what we call positive attention. So they experience more anhedonia and those sort of things that they are getting covered. So there are specific kind of details, but we realize that we need to keep it simple and feasible. So if you want to design a specific package which is specific stuff, it's not going to work at the end of the day. So we try to make that as general as possible. And we are using that for different in different settings. I mean, I mean it, we are, how it's going to work in long term, we are still developing evidence for, for, for how much these things are going to work. We, are, we need, probably need another 20 years of kind of completing the entire picture of what are the areas that are involved, how, and we are, I'm, I'm going to kind of invest the next 40 years of my career in this field. So these are, there are many things that we still need to do, and there are many things that we still don't know. I mean, and even for, for this branch, I told you that we are doing brain imaging before and after, but I'm still kind of recruiting patients for that. So probably next year, if I would be here next year, I will bring you some brain pictures. What would be the shape of the brain after? So these are things I still don't know. Nobody knows across the world. But we need to start to do something. So we know, it, we know that there, there are enough, we already have enough justification to start. And the good thing about this intervention is that there is no harm. And most of the time, especially those who are in the residential settings or in the compulsory settings, they, they do not receive that much intervention. Mm -hmm. They have lots of time that they are not really well covered. And I mean, the only thing they do is that you have to just basically a CBT, motivational interview, and all these things that we are providing right now are from something like 50, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Probably the only thing is relatively kind of newer is just ACT, mindfulness, to those kind of new movement. And even those things are, I mean, hundreds years long. So we know that we need to have something new that is going to be engaging, colorful. One, one session we had a problem with our printer and we printed the material in black and white. And people hated that. <laughs> because they really used to the colorful. <laughs> and that's, that's important so because it's going to be fun. And if people like that, they just keep on doing this. That's a really important part, part of recovery. If you like to have people keep on doing recovery, the recovery should be fun, should be pleasurable. Those who are doing the kind of running, they know that if you enjoy something, you would keep on doing that. If you enjoy attending the recovery session, you would keep on doing that. But if you feel that it's not that much, it's just boring. You do that for the treatment because you have to, but you would not continue that. But you want to bring new addictive behavior, I mean, your healthy habits to your life, and they really need to, to enjoy it. Yes? I have a question, um, you talk about um, neuropsychological assessment for the goals and steps for brain depression. How important is it in terms of like, any kind of program to do neuropsychological assessment prior or during this? First of all, I, I realize that people are a little bit afraid of doing neuropsychological rehabilitation because they feel that it needs a kind of intensive training and those sort of things. I think that you you can easily learn that, and I would not label that neuropsychological rehabilitation, but because it makes kind of a level of burden on the shoulders of those who are doing because they think that they are doing something like a neuro type of assessment. I would say that's just a basic cognitive assessment. I know that most of the people here. They, they probably are exposed to something like MOCA. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I, I would consider MOCA is one of the really complex ones. Mm -hmm. So the, there are many kind of cognitive that are even simpler than MOCA. Mm -hmm. So 
So you can easily do that. But those who are doing MOCA, if you are kind of competent to do MOCA, you definitely can do many other coding methods as well. So it's just, they're not, and even MOCA is really good. It's really, it's not designed for substance use, but I realized that probably because you had a psychiatrist who is from the geriatric side, probably they, I don't know, but that's my, my understanding, okay? Uh, so, no, that's not but by the way, yeah, the MOCA is designed for basically for, for geriatric population. Yeah. But but I like it. This one, the kind of the, it's really short and one page and probably it's not that much sensitive, but it's good. It's just a good starting point that you can you can start to do. We are doing right now for that system, we are mainly doing some of more kind of online because it would give us potentials to be able to test the speed as well, other than just the performance. It's not kind of the discussion for today, but there are definitely great potentials for being able to do cognitive assessment. It's not going to be that much complex. You can easily learn that and you can easily do that. And even sometimes, the cognitive assessment would be just a checklist, a self-report. Because there are already some self-report checklists about cognitive fun daily cognitive functions. And even when you provide them with a checklist of daily functioning, most of them they report that, okay, I have this problem, I have this problem. Like what I told you, I mean, those kind of uh, scenarios that we read here together, right? That we, people would relate themselves to those kind of scenarios. So they say that, okay, I already have this problem. Okay? So, seems doable to do the cognitive assessment. I recommend, and I realize that doing the cognitive assessment would make patients even more motivated to enter to the treatment and do the thing. Because they, had they would realize some deficits that they had. Yes? Just to answer a few questions, but this is just a wee story about the juggler. Last week I got a fellow from the staff room there and he juggled. And um, he had a client there was on and I said, oh, I'm going to teach him how to juggle. And I said, how was that? He says, well, he, he says he can, can't do anything. The least thing he'll do to juggle, he can say that he can do something. You know, so... <laughs> of course. Oh, well, sometimes you just... Even kind of understanding <coughs> that you can learn something new. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be fun. I mean, even even the kind of realizing because sometimes we really do not even believe that that we can learn a new skill. We can add a new tool to our skill set, and that's an important understanding. Yeah, yeah. I suppose what just my next thing was thinking about that. MRI and juggling, if you're actually doing the double while you're still using, say, cannabis or alcohol, does MRI still actually show changes? Like if that's it goes a, into That's a good question. Um, there are there are studies that they show if you do some sort of a specific sort of cognitive trainings while you are still using that is what it was about nicotine, but it could be about some other substance as well. While you are still using if you if you start today to kind of quit smoking, let's say your hope would be something like twenty percent. If you do these trainings and then start to quit smoking, your hope would be something like forty percent. So even those doing those trainings while you have not started to use would give you a better chance to be able to get to the to the abstinence level. But how much we already have evidence that those who are already using, actively using drugs, we can train them while they are using drugs, and, and we can train their brain. We, to be honest, we really don't know very much about that. There are just very few studies <coughs> with active drug <coughs> users with what we are discussing. You know that there, there are patients that are really hard to access, especially while they are non-treatment seekers. So, Right, that there are really few studies with non-treatment secure drug users because we don't have very much access to them. But one of my kind of, uh, I published a, a book chapter about this idea in terms of how we might be able to help those who are act still actively using drugs and they are not ready to come to treatment. Help them to reduce the harm by increasing their understanding about their brain. How can they learn what would be the safest way for their brain if they want to use drugs? And how they might be able to eat 
different things. For example, we know that men would make lots of kind of oxidative stress to the brain. Oxidative toxicity. And there are studies that they show that if you give people antioxidants while they are using meds, it could reduce the harm to the brain. So how we might be able to... Okay, we have a patient who is already using drug, not ready to come to treatment, not accepting what we are talking about, but we can provide them with kind of some, let's say, prevent... How we kind of... Those who have promiscuous behaviors, we just recommend them, okay, that is not true, that's not good, but for your health, but we provide you with a specific kind of barriers that would reduce the, the risk for you. So, or, let's say, I mean, I mean, all these harm reduction strategies, like if I have a kid that is really interested to have a motorbike and I do not have any control over that, probably I would just go and buy a really good, let's say, helmet for him. That is, that is the only thing I can do. I can at least go and buy the, the most expensive helmet in the, in the market. So that is what I can do. So this thing, and there are, I think there are interesting things for that side of neuroscience, but I think we have enough things to even educate people who are actively using drugs to reduce their harms based on the neuroscientific evidence that we have. <coughs> and that is, that is going to be important. But, I mean, who is going to do that? Who is going to pay money for that? How can you convince the policymakers to support us to develop something like that? Just they might say, okay, you are just encouraging others to use drugs and reduce it. So that one. I think we have to start a pretty, a pretty range. I don't have the luxury of say four weeks of detox throughout where we work. So what are the access services on on the outpatient basis? And um, so when I think about say a brain gym, getting to that point of say like, what can they do to maximise their brain? Like I, I often say, use my mother as an example. She's actually not just still teaches his music, she teaches my mother. You know, she a lot of very complex tasks and she still does that. And she's done it all her life and she's here, you know, she's in the shower and she's she'll remain so. Um, probably through bits of brain and like that, but it's been transferable skills in terms of, um, like I was saying before, um, skill acquisition in terms of, say, teaching someone to learn to bake a cake. They've got to read about the recipe, they've got to translate it to find all that stuff. So, um, getting some basics going and say, well, this is really good for this. Um, if you're playing, say, brackets sport, table tennis, it's good for high hand stuff, and this will be this for the brain. You know, just to get people doing those things. You go for a run, it'll make you feel good, you have some achievable goal. So it's maybe putting in some different languages as well. Of course, I 100% agree with you. There are definitely lots of potential uh, in terms of even thinking about how we optimize these things, how we can optimize these things based on the time and frames and context that we have. For example, you might, kind of, you might start to discuss with people in Nova, thinking about, okay, people are there for, let's say, two weeks. What can, I, what can we do in two weeks? People are there for six months, what can I do? So, and based on what people need to do after, and we can definitely think about those, those type of kind of arrangements. And even, I think, it's not just about people with substance use disorder. It's about our kids, about ourselves, it's about how we are really using our brain in an I will. I will discuss about some. I'm going to show you some slides about that as well. How can you? I mean, we we all can learn about brain in a way to use it in a better, more efficient way. And as a, a neuroscientist who has been in the field for something like 20 years, I can tell you there are many things that in the daily basis I learn that I can use my brain in a better way. So there are. Def They've had lots of really great things about that as well. So, given that a lot of your resources are quite academic and require people to be able to sort of read things, has there been any thought given to those with like low health literacy and how they might, how this might be sort of adapted to be able to sort of create a brain dream for sort of that group of people? Right now, I'm running a trial within a compulsory sort of drug court program for women 
their education is close to eight, nine, ten years, and works perfectly well. I can't think of it. <clears throat> yeah, so it's just really low level of education. They need to be literate. They need to be able to learn. And, and there are patients who are struggle to understand some of the concepts. That's but, but it works. I mean, and these there are many of them that they have never had any job. So just a <coughs> really basic level of entertainment. Uh, they they got a couple of diversion programs. So they, they can select between going to jail or going to this program. And now in this program we are we are offering them this, and they love it. And it was much better than my expectation, to be honest. And yeah, how it's going to work, at the, because we do brain imaging for these patients as well. Independent of what is going to see, be seen in the brain imaging part, I like it because they like it. I mean, they, they like it, and if, if, even if they are providing something that just fill their program with a fun activity, that is good as well. I mean, hopefully it would be more than just a fun activity, but uh, yeah, I, I, I at least the, the, the only thing that I'm pretty much confident about is that the, what they are doing is engaging enough for people, and it's feasible. So I'm 100% sure about these two parts. How much is going to be effective? You should see. How much is going to make a change in long term? These are the questions that we are still exploring. Sometimes clients like a bit of evidence to, you know, if you come, we can you know, get you to this level, because a lot of clients come and they say, is this permanent, or can I get my brain back to what it was before I did math, and sometimes I'm floundering to know, because everyone's different, and, you know, what their set point was before. Do we have any evidence to say that, you know, we can get people back to a certain... We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. I mean, nobody knows no. in the field. Uh, we are submitting a new kind of application for a, for a large grant that we are going to do brain imaging before recovery and follow patients across the tongue. We know that there are cognitive functions that would decline over the time in recovery. Especially in the early recovery, we have a decline and decline. But how is the time course of recovery for different brain functions? Is this something nobody knows? Mm -hmm. And we know that the, the most important message is that we know that the brain could definitely get better if you actively work on that. Okay. If it's going to be exactly the same as it was before, we don't know. We don't know. And we are not going to provide something like non visible hope for people. Okay. But we know that your brain would definitely get better if you do specific training, you just work on that, and you would just function much better. Exactly. And sometimes, exactly. And sometimes you have the same function, but you can learn how to use that function in a way that would be... So it's something like having a, like, let's say, Ferrari or a Toyota, but if you know how to drive with a Toyota Camry, you might be able to kind of even take a Ferrari with, uh, compared to a driver who doesn't know how to drive a Ferrari. So sometimes you just with a Toyota Camry brain could do lots of really good things if you know how to drive a Toyota Camry. I'm not sure. And I've seen that people driving uh, Toyota Camry, they have never used the Tiptronic uh, gear. So or um, there are great potential you can do kind of use the Toyota Camry or something like that. Brain's car. If you know how to it's important even if you have a brain to know how we are going to use whatever we got. But is it the success of treatments like this must be determined on the degree of damage? So if someone has severe, sub, you know, someone who's been drinking for 40 years, who drinks 30 plus standard drinks every day for years and years and years, versus someone who has been using, drinking really heavily for five years, what, what are the outcomes going to be for the person who has more severe damage versus someone who has, say, mild to moderate damage? Do you know what the... One of the interesting things in my, my experience is it's really hard to estimate the level of damage based on the severity of their use. Mm -hmm. There are patients that they have been using 
really intensive, but they don't have that much interest. Mm. And there are patients that have been using very mild, but they have significant injury. Mm. And there are factors contributing to that. One of the most important factors is their diet. Mm. If they are, they have a good diet, if they receive lots of good kind of antioxidants in their diet, and I had even a I have a really clear memory about that. I had uh, two brothers that they had to go to the men. And uh, one of them was really good cognitive, had a really good cognitive function, and the other one was really treble. And even the, the, kind of the, the first brother, he basically ended up joining our team as something like peer group counselor. And he was working for us for a while, but it was perfect. And when I was discussing with them, you haven't started to use meth together, and they're having the, almost the same age, and you have been using almost the same, and they are, they are brothers, like they have similar genetic background. And I had a talk about brain toxicity and the other things. After the talk, he came to me, I was discussing about antioxidative stress and how the loads are happening. He came to me and he explained to me, I found the reason. I love fruits, and my brother doesn't. Is it the reason? I don't know, but that might be. <laughs> so he was kind of eating tons of fruits, but his brother didn't. Could that be the case? What I mean, biologically, it might be possible because of the because it's really important about the, the level of oxidative stress that you receive from drugs and your how much of your diet could just compensate that as at, at least partially. <coughs> so that is one issue. The other thing that would be really important is the level of stress. Mm. So stress in combination with drug just mess up the brain. Mm. So those who have been using drugs with the stress, or those who have been using drugs without that much stress, that's another thing. The other thing that realize that's going to be really important is they are they have been they using drugs something like a, a stable way without fluctuating very much. Especially for opioids. Have they been using opioids know, constantly without experiencing withdrawal really much? Do they have a really kind of huge amount of money, kind of resource, financial resources? They have been using that and in a really stable way compared to those who have been just using, being intoxicated and withdrawal, intoxicated withdrawal, they have seen. So it's really hard <coughs> to say based on the, the level of draw that they. Obviously, those who have more severe injury at the end of the day, it would be harder for them to get into this. Yes. But I realized the most important factor for, uh, for predicting who's going to be a responder or not would be who has higher sustained motivation over time. Not motivation the first day, just sustained level of motivation, but they feel that, okay, this is something I'm going to do. <coughs> so keeping a sustained level of motivation is going to, to be really important. Yeah, I've got two questions. I mean, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the mm -hmm. session this morning. I found yeah. it fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think it's got a lot of applicability to some of the work we do. Um, my first question is about the Brain Gem program. And you said that there's a degree of adaptability in terms of length of program number of sessions, and because it's fairly modular. My question is specific to, as to whether it's a progressive program, therefore closed, or it could be operated as a, an open program. That's a good question. It's certainly most of the treatment settings that I could see it being useful, it would work better as an open program. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the, the, the challenge that we, we, we had and we have. Uh, for the brain healing program, we designed it as an open group setting. So we designed that in a way that people can attend from session two, three, four, and then session one, and receive the certification. So they can get into the program whenever they, they come to the center. So they can start from whatever session that they can. But for the brain gene, we realized it would be hard for people to catch up the changes, even when they sort of start, they, they join us session after session three, we really attend session four. Those who have been in recovery for, I mean, the treatment for three, four sessions, they would be always above them 
in all the functions. So it gets really hard. And that's a good thing about the, the program because it makes a change in a way that it would be hard for people to catch the group. Uh, but is it going to be doable to do that, at least in a, a sort of modular way? Because, for example, the, the brain gym is designed to have two parts, the first part and the second part. The first part is mainly going to focus on attention, the second part is mainly focus on memory and, and decision making. So we can still kind of be flexible, at least think about, let's say, each four session would be graded from session one to four, and then four to five, four, one to four, design that in a way that would be too open to some extent. Yeah, we need to kind of work on that. But it seems doable. We need to see what people like to have and adapt based on that. So that is what we, we want to kind of plan for. Second question. Um, a lot of the stuff you talked about this morning, I can see it being very effective on attention, memory, for communication. But the one thing we found, particularly in STAR, that's really difficult to see any progress with is people's ability to reason, both the insights. And I'm just curious as to whether your experience reflects that as well. Yep. You have two friends and they, they need to be yeah. earlier. Yeah. Same flight back. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else who needs to leave? Yeah, we yeah. got it. Thank you. Okay, let me just finish that and then answer this question. I have a kind of answer question, answer, a good answer to that. Let me just finish this in just five minutes and then people can, those who want to leave earlier, they can leave. Uh, today we discussed about cognitive deficits, I recall. Okay? and how cognitive deficit recovery is going to be helpful. What do we do for cognitive deficit right now? There are specific targets for cognitive education and cognitive reactivation. So we have discussed about some of those targets and how we might need to target those. We discussed about metacognitive training. And I told you that metacognitive training is going to be important. We discussed how to communicate complex functions to patients. It's really important, really important to use cartoons, scenarios, games, make things understandable and fun for the patients. We discussed about successful features of a cognitive rehabilitation, successful uh, cognitive rehabilitation program. Okay, this is my, my picture, so you cannot see <laughs> <it>. <laughs> this guy here. But this is me a few years ago. When I was going to show you, it was something like 50 pounds heavier. Okay. And I was working with people who ended up being using drugs. It was kind of, one day I received a feedback that, I mean, you are talking about drug craving. How can you control your food craving? I said, okay, that's reasonable, so I need to think about that. And I started to kind of, I accepted a PhD student, and we started to work to develop a, a sort of kind of uh, weight reduction program based on kind of neuroscience and those things. And I started to, to run as well, and I kind of did my first half marathon kind of a few years ago, and I lost 50 pounds in that process. And I usually tell people that if you want to work in this world, it's good for you to also think about how, what are the things you can change in your life. Because this, we always tell others to change something in their life. But what are the things that we can do for our life? And we can change that. And I ran my first marathon a few months ago. I'm getting ready for the second one in Dallas in a few months in, in December. So I think that change, understanding that change is possible is going to be critically important. And wherever I go, I, just, I was in, in Nelson in kind of a Saturday. So I ran in Nelson. A, a uh, half marathon, and kind of yesterday I was running in one of the wild, really nice beaches in, in Auckland. It was, what was the name of the Spiegels. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was nice and nice. Yeah, <laughs> it was fantastic. So wherever I go, I, I run, and I, I try to see whatever <coughs> I've learned from neuroscience, how those things could help me to change my life. I think that is really important to have a science that helps you to change yourself before starting to 
kind of encourage others mm -hmm. to help to change yourself. So I think that you should start, and you think about how you might be able to do cognitive training for yourself, how to learn more about brain. And I think that I've done kind of these sort of kind of cognitive trainings for, for normal people, and I realize that we can still learn many things about our brain and help our brain in the process of recovery. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that I mean, that will be at least a starting point for you to get involved in this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.